Welcome to part 2, but before we begin, I'd like to clarify a few things. In the majority of my Marvel videos, you'll see me compare the films and shows to the comics, often faulting the films for deviating from them. When I do this, I'm not simply suggesting that something is bad because it strays from the source, but rather, I'm comparing and contrasting two interpretations of the same story. If the comics tell the story better, I will fault the film for not reaching its level of quality, which tends to happen a lot with the MCU. If the film tells a better story than the comic, which very rarely happens, then I will praise the film for its elevated quality. If the movies deviate without necessarily being better or worse, then I will make that distinction as well. Point being, the main reason that I refer to the comics so often is because they usually contain far better stories and concepts than what are presented to us in the films, and it is a goal of mine to let everyone know what they're missing out on, in hopes that people will raise their standards and push Marvel to make better movies. Also, it seems I've created some confusion when I talked about the angry bald man from Iron Man 1, as several comments have mentioned that he was shot off screen and presumably killed, so he would have no way of returning for a later film. So I would like to set the record straight. First off, an off-screen death in a superhero film is basically just a fancy way of saying see you later, and I wasn't necessarily suggesting that he was for sure going to return as a Mandarin. Rather, I was suggesting that the pieces were in place had they wanted to go down that road. The name of his group, the Ten Rings, is an obvious reference to the ten magical rings that the Mandarin uses to fuel his great power. They also give him this evil-ass scar, so how can you not expect some big sinister things from this guy? But regardless, they wanted to go with Ben Kingsley instead, and I fully endorse that being a better change had they played it straight. I only brought up Baldy to hammer down the point that they could have built up their villains over multiple films, but lacked the foresight to do so, so I hope that clears things up. Lastly, I mentioned what Malkith used to look like in the books, but I failed to mention what he did. This guy is basically Marvel's Starscream, in the sense that he's a villain who's hated by both heroes and other villains alike, and despite being killed over and over again, he always manages to somehow keep coming back with various schemes. He's gotten on the bad side of pretty much everybody, from Carnage to Curse to Cable. It could have been fun to see this Arbiter of Chaos constantly popping up and interfering with conflicts that he would normally have no business being a part of. It's rare to see villain versus villain encounters, so his presence could be a fun shakeup. you know, instead of being a forgettable void. Now with that all out of the way, let's get moving forward. That brings us happily along to Guardians of the Galaxy. This one is a little complicated. Let's start with Ronin the Accuser. He's not a big blob, but he sure has a lot of grey. Ronin is decently used within this film, as his cold and stray personality plays well against the wild and unorthodox Guardians. However, in the grander scheme of the MCU, Ronin doesn't really stand out and hasn't really left much of an impact. In other words, he's just kind of basic and forgettable. Though, not as forgettable as most other entries. It's not that he necessarily needs a flamboyant look and personality to stand out, but his failings more so come from the fact that he doesn't really do anything particularly interesting. Most of his scenes just include him doing generic villain stuff, and while that can sometimes be a good thing, when placed in the right context, it does leave a little something to be desired. Plus, would it be so bad to just brighten up the green a little? It's hard to tell where his costume ends and the void of space begins. We also have Korath, in this film as a minor threat. Who? In the comics, he's a colorful alien. In the movie, he's just kind of an abnormally normal looking dude. Unremarkable, very forgettable. On the plus side, Nebula was also introduced in this film, and she is one of the few standout exceptions. She has a great design, she has a sympathetic edge wrapped in a hard exterior, and Karen Gillan gives her a very memorable performance. She becomes a hero eventually, but her journey is a very subtle and natural progression that is a treat to watch unfold over the course of multiple films. Nebula was one of the few good ones. It's just a shame that she got robbed of a great ending, but that's a discussion for a future date. It's also interesting that Guardians Volume 1 introduced the Collector as well, originally a member of a near-immortal species that also includes the Grand Master, and we'll get to him soon enough. The Collector was someone who would search the universe to, you guessed it, collect various species in order to ensure that life would go on after an ominous impending apocalypse. He would often clash with Marvel's heroes when he would try to collect one of them, or for other similar reasons, such as having portions of his collection managing to get set loose. His great collection would give him access to a nearly limitless array of powerful weapons and armor that he would use to conduct his antics. The movie seemed to maintain his collecting, but more so treated it like a hobby with no greater purpose, and made the collector himself just kind of a random guy, as opposed to being a member of a very powerful species. Traditionally, a clash between him and Thanos would have been a big deal, but in the movies, it's so irrelevant that it happens off screen. Next up is Avengers Age of Ultron. And, oh boy, this is another one that's going to take a while. Before we can even talk about the main man, we need to discuss Baron Strucker. Why was he even here? When the Red Skull would go out of commission, Baron Strucker 
Joker would take his place as the head of Hydra, and would use a life-draining gauntlet to maintain his youth over the decades. He is used similarly in the film. Just kidding, he literally does nothing of value. Honestly, what was the point of having him there? They got him all hyped up in the last post credit scene, only to just make a joke out of him when it was his time to shine. The only reason he exists is to be a vessel to introduce Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Strucker isn't an A-list villain or anything, so it isn't a major loss. It's just frustrating because the MCU continuously does nothing with their villains when they could have done something. They put too much emphasis on being funny and subversive, and forget to add stakes and investment. A potential worthwhile threat got completely wasted, but it's fine because a couple people chuckled when he got beat up, right? Now speaking of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, these two simply do not belong in this story, and all they do is congest it. It seems like they were only forced into this film because Fox was also wanting to use Quicksilver around the same time for Days of Future Past, but let it be known that the MCU Quicksilver was a serious step down from the now iconic X-Men Quicksilver. It's not that these two were used poorly, Scarlet Witch in particular got a decent introduction, but the problem is that this film has a lot of characters to balance out, and these two just get in the way of that. The ones who suffer the most from this congestion are Ultron himself, and especially Vision. For those who don't know, Ultron originally created Vision to essentially be his right-hand man, being the guy who would do all his dirty work. He starts out as being pure evil, and a major threat for the Avengers, but as time goes on, he begins to learn empathy, and starts to see the good that humanity has to offer, which leads him to eventually betray Ultron and switch sides. In the film, we see nothing of Vision until the way end where they jam pack his introduction and position on the team right before the finale. And it couldn't be a messier intro. We don't know anything about this guy. He seems to have a deep understanding of the world, and a preformed moral constitution. Yet he also seems to struggle with things like cooking and social interaction. So where does his knowledge base start and end? We reconfigured Jarvis's matrix to create something new. I'm not Ultron. I'm not Jarvis. I am. I am. Okay. They also never explain his complex powers. For you movie only fans, did you know that his main power is to control his density? He's able to fly and phase through objects by making his density very light, and he becomes strong and durable by increasing his density. Increasing density. Current weight, 500 tons. We don't get to see that in the movies, and we don't really get much depth out of Vision in general. We don't get to see how Vision comes to love humanity. He just literally comes out of the box thinking that way with an ambiguous explanation as to why. I am on the side of life. Ultron isn't. Okay. The MCU writers mainly just treat him as a static good guy, who is as powerful or weak, or as smart or as dumb as they need him to be. If it were up to me, I would cut out Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch from this film entirely, and introduce them at a later date, so we can spend more time developing Vision and Ultron as characters. At the very least, they could have introduced Vision early on as a villain who works alongside Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, and then have them all decide to switch teams together at the end, while also developing the early stages of their romance in the process. Ultron working alongside these two is an odd, paradoxal mix-up anyway. Ultron's whole MO is being anti-humanity and desiring the extinction of the human race. So to see him working alongside humans right out the gate, then like, getting sad when they leave, is a very bizarre change that makes for an awkward story. Guys, right. Ultron's portrayal was in fact a very bizarre overall. The nihilistic, sarcastic, subversive writing style of Joss Whedon was not a good fit for a more primal story about the good of humanity and a fight for its survival. Whedon can't seem to write a character that appeals to the good of humanity because he doesn't see it himself. They're doomed. Yes. And he can't write a straight, cold killer, because traditional archetypes are not his style. Instead, he tries to make Ultron this LOL so random funny guy to try and mirror RDJ's Iron Man. Smaller people? Children! I lost the word there. While it's appreciated to make an attempt to elevate this character and bring something new, the execution just wasn't there. Unfortunately, this new spin on the character means writing him the same exact way that Joss writes everyone else. I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. As long as there is life in my breast, I am running out of things to say. Are you ready? 
What's worse is that he has a terrible design, being yet another big grey blob. Ultron traditionally has an ever-evolving body due to the constant upgrades that he gives himself, though his iconic face always remains relatively the same. For the film, there was a lot of room for creative freedom in that regard, but they went with an over-designed look with way too many moving parts that, when combined, became messy and unappealing to look at. That extends to his face as well, which was a major blunder. It seems that an attempt was made to make Ultron more expressive and relatable, but like his relationship with the twins, this design choice clashes with his character's style. This villain is anti-humanity. The last thing he should be is expressive and human-like. There is a good story beat you could hit by using the dramatic irony of giving a killer robot human-like desires and faults, but the point of that is that it needs to be ironic. Play him straight, make him cold, disconnected, and ruthless, but then slap some small cracks into his foundation. A glimmer of empathy here, a double standard there, be subtle about it and slowly let it build up to his downfall. Example, Ultron is modeled after Hank Pym's brain, so as a result, he'll have a soft spot for the wasp, and this will give him the subconscious desire to create his own wasp. His low-key desire for love will contradict his motives, and his desire to wipe out humanity will become hypocritical. Then this broken logic will be noticed by Vision, and give him a bigger push towards switching sides. If humans are so horrible and imperfect, then why are you acting just like one? Look at what you're doing! You're making yourself a girlfriend? You don't even see it, do you? You're becoming just like us. The movie played with the idea of giving Ultron human-like faults, but with no subtlety whatsoever, to the point where he doesn't even act like a machine at all. They had a unique concept sitting right in front of them, but they scrapped it in favor of being mundane. This is not a unique spin on the character, this is just a stock Joss Whedon villain. Not to mention, this design simply doesn't look good. It's a clear downgrade to his intimidating classic look. The minions shouldn't look scarier than the main boss. The Age of Ultron film as a whole is packed full of problems, so much so that I definitely want to make a dedicated breakdown to the entire thing at some point. But for the sake of this villain discussion, it's worth mentioning that Ultron simply does not fit well in this stage of the MCU's development. This is a Thanos level threat, yet he's being utilized as a stepping stone to hold our attention while we wait for Thanos to be built up. And just to clarify, I'm not making that claim based on power level, but more so on popularity and depth of storytelling. To only use Ultron for one film with a botched, congested adaptation is a serious waste, and it doesn't do enough to add to the longer ongoing story. Avengers 1 did well in that regard, using Loki as an underling of Thanos and giving us a taste of what Thanos' army has to offer. It's a good way to build up things to come while still being an isolated story. Ultron doesn't really offer anything to the Infinity Saga. Vision has a stone and we get new characters, but the main villain himself is just kind of irrelevant here. A better route to go would be to feature a villain who is more closely tied to Thanos and one that would raise the stakes for his arrival. As far as Ultron goes, he is big enough and has a diverse enough array of stories to have a dedicated saga all to himself. There is a lot more to say here, including how the title of the film is taken from a comic with a wildly different story, but like I said earlier, I'll save the remainder of my criticisms for their own dedicated video. So let's move on for now. Onward to Ant-Man featuring the Yellow Jacket. We've already talked about this guy a bit recently, but now let's go a bit more in depth. In the comics, the Yellow Jacket was an alternate super persona Hank Pym donned after undergoing personality changes and passing on the Ant-Man mantle to Scott Lang. As Yellow Jacket, Pym's power set included a size-changing gun, the ability to fly, and the ability to grow amongst other things. Obviously in the movie, Yellow Jacket is completely different. His identity is assumed by by Darren Cross, who is essentially a less charismatic bargain bin John Bernthal. His costume is a pudgy mess of yellow and black splotches, and his abilities basically make him an evil Ant-Man with shoulder lasers. And with his introduction comes more of the same standard issues. Darren is incredibly vanilla. He has a stock, generic personality, and he's just a standard mirror match that doesn't offer much worth remembering, aside from getting hit in funny ways. We'll come back to the problem with mirror matches in a moment, but for now let's move on to Civil War. Some of you might think there might not be much to say here, since this movie was pretty good and and it's just heroes fighting heroes. It's false. No way. Not this time. Absolutely not. This movie is one of the worst offenders. There is some good here though, so let's cover that first. In this film, we get a prime example of why you shouldn't make jokes out of your villains, and we see the benefits of taking them seriously. The Winter Soldier had a near-perfect debut in his titular film. They made it very clear that this guy was fast, dangerous, and would take our heroes out if they didn't give it their all. They made him look like a badass, and now, as a result, the Black Panther gets to look like an uber badass, with how deadly he looks when he's pursuing this guy. He makes the world's most experienced assassin and fear for his life. You make your heroes look good when you make your villains look good. Alright, now on to the bad stuff. I think I look pretty good, all things considered. So Crossbones came back, and it seems the MCU is making a trend out of wiping Captain America's villains in the first scene of the movie. Crossbones had a good setup in Winter Soldier, and has a relatively good design in Civil War, except for when they give him these doofy rock'em sock'em puncho gloves for some reason. It seems like they were trying to beef him up so he could be a match for Captain America, but these gloves are just silly looking. A normal knife would have been more effective here. Peace. 
Crossbones is used in this film as a replacement for Nitro. Nitro is a powerful villain who has the ability to make himself explode. In the comic, he escaped prison with several other villains and went into hiding in a small suburban town. However, their whereabouts were discovered by a bunch of rookie superheroes who ambushed them with a camera crew to try and make a name for themselves. This is how it played out. Somebody snag Nitro! He's rabbiting! Don't worry, Speedball. I'm on it. On your feet, Nitro. And don't bother trying any of your stupid exploding tricks. Oh, baby, don't you even know. <laughs> You're playing with the big boys now. And then everybody died. It's a powerful moment because these inexperienced heroes provoke a villain to attack when he otherwise wouldn't have, and a city got wiped out as a result of their hubris and desire for fame, and thereby creating a good argument for superhero registration. The movie makes an attempt at a similar scene, but it's less effective because Crossbones was the aggressor here, and innocent lives were already in danger. These heroes were just responding appropriately. Then when Crossbones tries to blow himself up, Scarlet Witch does do the right thing, and saves all the people around her, but her fault comes in because she wasn't able to save absolutely everybody. It's a classic case of having your cake and eating it too, because the writers want their good guys to be good, but they also need a reason for registration to exist, and they want Scarlet Witch to be at fault while still being innocent at the same time. It does just enough to get the point across of the story, but by doing it this way, the narrative becomes way more contrived than it needs to be. In the comic, the heroes were undoubtedly in the wrong, and they were acting in an extremely irresponsible manner, with more severe consequences and a far bigger kaboom. And would you like to know what Crossbones did in the Civil War comic instead? Spoiler alert, he killed Captain America. So this is all a bit of a step down if you ask me. General Ross returns in this film, or I guess Secretary Ross now. The Secretary of State. His role has basically been reduced to a glorified cameo, as he only exists to introduce the heroes to the Sokovia Accords. This is the best he gets to do since the Hulk isn't allowed to be relevant anymore. But what's even more disappointing here is that Ross is being used as a tepid replacement for Maria Hill. Now this may come as a shock for you movie-only fans, but comic Maria Hill is just the worst. She is a villain masquerading as a good guy. During the time of the comic Civil War, Nick Fury is out of commission, so she takes over as Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and enforces superhero registration with an iron fist treating any heroes that resist registration as being just as reprehensible as the villains that they take down. She's a real smug prick about it too. This antagonistic role is subtly set up in the first Avengers, as Hill would constantly question Fury, and there is even a deleted scene where she fully disapproved of the Avengers altogether. You've filed several reports criticizing Director Fury's actions since you joined S.H.I.E.L.D. Because he's reckless. We're at war. And he thinks about superheroes. However, that was all scrapped in favor of what? Her being sarcastic gun shooty girl number 16, and doing absolutely nothing of relevance for the entirety of the MCU. What a revolutionary change. I love it when they remove a character's standout qualities, so they can all just talk and act like they're all the same person. You want superhero fatigue? This is how you get superhero fatigue. Then we have Baron Zemo, and like the Mandarin, this one is yet another disappointingly tragic bastardization. He had the potential to be one of the MCU's most iconic villains. But, like all the others, they degraded him into yet another forgettable nobody. In the comics, there is a long bloodline of Baron Zemos, but two stand out as the most significant. Heinrich, who fought against Captain America in the 40s, and the one we're here to talk about the most, his son Helmut, who fights against the Avengers in the modern age. Side note, the first Avenger quickly montaged through Captain America's entire war effort to skip straight to the end, which seemed unfortunate at the time, but it also seemed like a stroke of genius as far as long-term storytelling goes, because that would give them the ability to use flashbacks to reference other Captain America villains during World War II who had not been casted yet until later films, such as Strucker and Heinrich Zemo. It's just too bad that the MCU failed to realize that they created this opportunity for themselves and never capitalized off of it. That, or they simply didn't care enough to connect those dots. Unlike Red Skull, who is more of an evil mirror of Captain America, Zemo is more so his rival, in that like Captain America, he is able to accomplish great things, despite only being a relatively normal human. He does this by being smart enough and imposing enough to persuade powerful people to his side, even even if those measures are deceptive, and he's ballsy enough to order around gods and monsters alike, essentially forming his own evil Avengers team. You may call me master. Now kneel before me. Are you mad, mortal? Thor kneels before no one. As I said, Kneel before your masters. 
Despite lacking power, he makes himself important by having the knowledge and the plans that allow other villains to find success where they otherwise would not have alone. And depending on the story, he'll stand on his own by finding various weapons or power-ups to give himself the edge. On top of all that, his design is very aesthetically pleasing. Just looking at all this amazing artwork makes you wonder how great he could have looked on the big screen had the MCU higher-ups decided they wanted to put the effort in. The casting was on point at least. You can't go wrong with a Tarantino guy. They had the right idea with him being a normal man with big ambitions. However, they went too far and made him too normal. They tried too hard to make him empathetic and relatable, to the point where he becomes a boring fart that puts you to sleep whenever he's on screen. He's not intimidating and he's certainly not dangerous. His comic self forms multiple super teams that rival the Avengers. This guy looks like he'd struggle to make his dog go potty outside. They bring him back in Falcon and Winter Soldier, with an attempt to make him more like his old self, but... <laughs> Yeah, there were a lot of things they could have done to make things right, but this was not one of them. They would rather make their jokes and have him dance around like a fool than make a real character. They gave him something that resembles his iconic purple mask, but it looks like shit, so I don't know why they even bothered if they're going to be that low effort about it. Why is Deadpool the only movie that knows how to make a good looking mask? Oh yeah, and Captain America's gone now, so there's really no point. Too little, too late. Baron Zemo could have been one of the all-time great movie villains. Instead, we get this sad pudge who dances around like a donkey. He and the other villains are big brown stains in an otherwise solid movie. And you wish to know why I lead? Because I am better than you. I really think I'm invaluable. Shut up. After Civil War, we have Doctor Strange, and this one is perplexing. The main villain is Caecilius. Caecilius is a rather obscure comic villain, just being a servant for Baron Mordo. However, in this film, Caecilius is somewhat upgraded to take the place of Baron Mordo as an evil mirror version of Doctor Strange. That's all well and good, except Baron Mordo himself is also in this film, and undergoes an arc that leads him to obtain a similar mindset as Caecilius. Then Mordo goes on to do absolutely nothing, but then when Strange encounters an alternate universe version of Mordo, he speaks about his own Mordo as if Mordo was Caecilius. You know you hated me where I came from. So that begs the question, why? 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 Why any of this? Why Caecilius? Why didn't they just make Mordo the villain from the start, instead of having two of the same guy? Moreover, why does the MCU need so many mirror matches? This is one of the most overused villain archetypes, and at this stage of development, the MCU is hurting itself for relying on them so much. Mirror villains, aka a villain who is an evil copy of the hero, aren't inherently bad, and can often be an interesting shakeup, with good themes of the hero overcoming the worst aspects of themselves. But more often than not, they tend to get thrown into superhero stories because the writer can't think of anything more creative. A villain like Venom is different enough from Spider-Man to justify him being around, and a villain like the Winter Soldier has a strong enough impact on the story to warrant his existence. But Caecilius has neither of those qualities. He's basically just a tutorial boss for Strange to beat before he can do more exciting things. He is just Doctor Strange, but bad. You know, thematically speaking of course. They don't do that literally until later. The big problem with mirror villains though is that they take what makes your hero special and nullifies it. Ant-Man's edge is that he shrinks, but Yellow Jacket can do that too. So as a result, they just have a normal fight, but small. The Flash has super speed, the Reverse Flash has super speed, so when they fight, it might as well just be normal people fighting, but just at a faster speed. Superpowers can be fun tools to solve complex problems, often stemming from villains with complex powers of their own, but super speed is no longer super if it's just as fast as the other guy. Again, this can work under the right story structure, but writers overuse this trope to the extreme, to the point where it becomes mundane and boring. Within the MCU, almost half the films contain a mirror villain of some sort. Make no mistake, this problem originates from the comics, but the comics are at least vast enough to the point where you can skip over the boring ones. However, the MCU cannot afford to make such mistakes, and it shouldn't have to since the comics already exist and give us the benefit of hindsight for what works and what doesn't. They have a massive pool of villains to pick from for each hero, yet they always seem to go with Mr. I'm you, but evil. This film does deserve some praise though, due to their creative use of Dormammu. In the Marvel Universe, Dormammu is a very big deal, and is a major threat. The film says as much too, but thankfully Doctor Strange has the Time Stone which is powerful enough in and of itself to overrule Dormammu, and it makes for a fun shakeup during the final battle, instead of the usual CGI slapfest that we normally get. By doing it this way, Doctor Strange is able to save the day, but Dormammu isn't necessarily made out to be weak as a result, and he has a chance to return later on as the proper powerhouse that he is, especially now that Doctor Strange has given up the Time Stone and no longer has access to it. At least... I think he doesn't. Regardless, this fight was praiseworthy. Plus it's memeable, so bonus points for that. Dormammu? 
I've come to bargain. His design, however, was rather bizarre. Unlike his classic flame-headed look, he's just a big purple mess. That said, it would be easy for someone as powerful as Dormammu to change his form if he so desired. So if Dormammu were to ever return, the MCU creatives could tweak his look if they wanted to. You know, when I first got the idea to make a video about this topic, I expected it to be about 10 to 15 minutes long, but it seems I have greatly underestimated just how problematic the MCU villains are. So this will be the stopping point for part 2. But part 3 will come very soon. Or maybe, if you people don't like and subscribe, I'll just drop part 3 entirely and start making Spy Kids content instead. This is a threat. You've been warned.